Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Age of Information. As always, I'm your host, Adam Patrick, and uh, hopefully you can't hear the dog barking in the background. I think we have enough silencers on this recording equipment here to alleviate that. I don't know what they're going crazy about, but it's finally warm out here. It's like um, maybe 45 degrees in Southern Connecticut after a week of being in the teens. So um, I guess people let their dogs run around in their yard. Whatever. Um, all right, everybody, welcome. We're going to uh, pump out today something really uh, important, but really quickly, and it's going to be the D.K. And uh, basically, my my commitment to try to put out one of these shows um, at least once a week for this entire year, there's going to be just live readings. Um, and if I can get to two or three of them a week, and that way we have time for uh, guests and we don't have to back up the guest pool, um, I hope to do that as well. But I also want to have this kind of... Um, a cache of uh, text for people to refer to. So I'm sure there are, if you go on YouTube, many different readings of this text or other early Christian texts, right? The Clement letters or the Shepherd of Hermas or whatever, right? I'm sure there's a million of them out there. Um, but we'll do it here and we'll do a little bit of commentary. And then at least we, we know we have it um, if anyone wants to refer to it. Or maybe they just like hearing the sound of my voice, which you'd be in a small minority of people. But Nevertheless, we'll have that here. Before we do that, though, excuse me, I want to just jump into something here real quick. And it's a comment um, on the 30-minute or so video I put up, How to Tackle Atheist Presuppositions in Debate. And <clears throat> before I read it, I want to just um, maybe fill in the gaps, right? Because who is the person who wrote it here? Uh, Auntie... Anti-theist juror, anti-theist juror, and uh, their second one was I appear to appear to have blocked my own reply, uh, which is weird. I don't know. I, maybe I did. I don't know. But um, I did respond to it just about ten minutes ago. Um, but I'll talk on it because depending on who you're hearing this argument from, um, they may or may not lay out the entire thing in one sitting. Right. So, I mean, it, it's been it's been 20 or so years since I learned uh, presuppositional argumentation or the idea of transcendental arguments. And at the time, I learned it in the context of a non-Christian point of view, a non-Christian worldview. So the idea was to go after different theist positions, right, in, in order to in presup them in order to get them to kind of give up their um their higher level paradigms, right? And and so what this really amounts to is at the fundamental level, at the at the first position, the starting position of your worldview, right? There's going to be something there that has to be assumed to be the case in order for the rest of it to work. It could be God, it could be the flying spaghetti monster, it could be Buddha, it could be uh, Asaroth, right? It could be anything. It could be that hippopotamus god from the show lost right that also shows up in marvel's moon knight right the hippopotamus lady uh statue thing right what or it could just be reason and logic right that whatever your first principle is you say well i don't i know everything i can improve everything but i need this thing in order for that to work right you say well i can do the scientific method what do i need for the scientific method to work i need numbers i need language i need logic Right. Well, logic is not something you can prove with the scientific method. Right. It's not something you even if you don't like just the scientific method, if you think there are and I would agree uh, different ways of proving things. It's not something you can prove empirically. You can't prove logic empirically. You can't hold logic in your hand. Right. So it has to be assumed to be the case in order for logical things to work. Right. So if you talk to a Matt Dillahunty or any of these atheist types, a Sam Harris, one of these people. And you, you'll say to them, well, where does logic come from? They always say, well, it just is. It just is. And it has to be the case. We have to assume it's the case. Otherwise, nothing else works. Listen to any Sam Harris talk. And he'll say, well, grant me this starting position. And therefore, everything else after that flows from that. Right. Well, we're saying is in his worldview, that doesn't work because it's not empirical. You can't just say, well, here's something I can't prove, but it has to exist. Therefore, it just is. Why, why is it? I just say it is. <laughs> right? That is the same thing they're accusing a theist of doing 
when we presuppose God, right? They're doing the same thing. And what I'm saying and what everyone else is saying is this is inevitable. This is, this is unavoidable, right? We're not blaming them for this. This is this, something you can't get away from. <laughs> I'm saying this is what makes the atheist position ridiculous is that they claim it's based in reason and logic, except they can't explain what reason and logic is. What is reason? What is logic? It just is. How do I know that? I just do. Right? So what Quine is saying in the paper, Two Dogmas of Empiricism, he's saying this amounts to fairy tales. Quine is an empiricist, right? And he's saying this amounts to fairy tales. What is his fix to this? Empirical uh, psychology. He says, we can't do this first principle thing. It's not going to work. So we're going to move on to psychology. And that's how we're going to study the human brain. Right. And of course, this is what when you start getting into the Sam Harris and all these people, this is what they do. They work with psychology. Right. And we can dissect that later on. I have a good background in psychology as well. But that's what I wanted to point out to this person who says <clears throat> this anti theist juror as Christian presuppositionalist arguments are hated almost as much by Christians as non Christians. First of all, we'll stop there. Uh, did you take a, did you take a poll? They're hated almost as much by Christians as non Christians. I mean, it's, it doesn't matter to me or anyone else if you do or don't like the argument, right? You can not listen to the channel or you can just accept that worldviews and paradigms are an unescapable reality of life <laughs> and people have to hold them whether they want to or not. Otherwise, there is no way to make sense of anything. There is no way to make an argument, have a conversation. There's no way to know what is happening in here corresponds to what is happening out there. And what is happening out there corresponds to what is happening in here, right? So they, whether or not you like it or don't like it is that it doesn't matter, right? That's what it is. So, and then uh, he or she goes on to say, this idea of competitive presuppositionalism, I've always found a bit of an odd one. Um, okay, I, I responded to the words competitive presuppositionalism, but what I'm saying is the reason that you might see it as competitive, right? is that we can't have a conversation with somebody who operates under a different worldview because we're going to be using the same words, but each one of us is going to think they mean something different and we're not going to have the same conversation. So there is no way to move anything forward. So in order for that to work, one person has to grant the other person their worldview. And if you listen to the 30 minute video that you're responding to, Anti theist juror, you will see that I mentioned that, right? I mentioned that when, um, uh, what's his name? Who did the thing? Uh, Coppleston and, and, and Bertrand Russell had the debate in 1948. Coppleston grants Russell his starting position. He, Coppleston essentially says, I'm not going to use the Bible. I'm going to argue from pure reason. And that's granting the initial premise starting position to Bertrand Russell, who's an atheist. Right. You have to go one way or the other, or you're going to be talking about two different things and it's not going to be any way to have a conversation. Right. I'm suggesting that it works the other way around. Right. That there's no way I'm going to surrender my position to the theist position. Right. We're either going to get them to come play on our playing field or we're not going to accept them wholesale. Right. And so that's what that means. Um, <clears throat> then he or she. And I'm saying she because there's a female in the picture, it looks like, and it says auntie. So I'm assuming it, it could be a, a female, but it could just be a troll who's a dude, too. So I mean, <laughs> trying to trying to grant them the benefit of the doubt here. Uh, he or she says both Christian, both Christian and non-Christians are stuck dealing with axiomatic knowledge, whether they like it or not. Um, we are stuck dealing with information, whether we like it or not. Sure. You know, I don't know. Again, we'd have to decide what we mean by axiomatic knowledge. Um, I know what I think you mean by it, but I don't know exactly your the precepts you're bringing into it. So we could mean something different. Uh, I'd be willing to grant that we mean the same thing by axiomatic knowledge. That's possible, but I don't know that, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say for sure. Uh, he or she says, at minimum, the three logical absolutes and a lack of a solution for hard solipsism. Uh, both Christian and non-Christians are stuck dealing with axiomatic knowledge or they not. At minimum, the three logical absolutes and a lack of solution for hard solipsism. Uh, so solipsism is like if you just believe you exist, by the way, if anyone doesn't know what, what that means. It's like take Descartes' uh, 
I, I think therefore I am and then stop there. <laughs> and there's no other thinking people out there. It's just you and your thinking and everything else, right? That's what solipsism is. Um, and then here she says, having an overarching God presupposition would just seem to add to the list unnecessarily. So I think we've demonstrated seven or eight times over the course of the last couple of weeks why it's not just unnecessary, it's actually unavoidable that there has to be an overarching something presupposition. It doesn't have to be God, but what, what ends up happening is whatever you're going to substitute in place of God ends up acting like God. And for Kant or Spinoza, it's certainly not the God of the Bible, right? I would argue if you're a Roman Catholic or a Protestant, you're not even arguing for the same God as an Orthodox Christian, right? You're calling, it's the same God in nominal senses, right? <laughs> like it's, you, you might think as an outsider, they're talking about the same God. But if you look at how John Calvin or uh, Pope Francis describes God, those are not the same God between John Calvin and Pope Francis. And neither one of them is talking about the same God um, as uh, John Chrysostom, right? I mean, I, I, there's no way anybody could agree with that. So obviously Kant or Spinoza or Albert Einstein or anybody who had this pantheistic uh, conceptualization of God that there has to be, or Aristotle, the unmoved mover, right? The first, the first principle, the first cause, the uncaused cause, <laughs> right? There's gotta be something there and we are, as Orthodox Christians, just saying Yahweh is that, right? It's not that difficult to understand. It really isn't. And I'm not trying to be rude because you put that you find the belittling of people I don't agree with a bit wearing after a while. Well, if people understood very simple concepts, we wouldn't have to get frustrated that we have to keep explaining them over and over and over again. Because you understand, this. it's not like a bunch of Orthodox Christian dudes in their 30s and 40s sat down 10 years ago and made this up, right? Like, you guys do get that that this goes back thousands of years. And even within the last hundred years, presuppositionalism, yes, it has been taken on by folks like Van Thiel in the Protestant circles, folks like us in the Orthodox circles in different, different, but it's, it's not historically been that way. <laughs> historically, this idea comes out of the empiric empiricist tradition, the logical positivist classical foundationalist position. There has to be something in the beginning. Now, you could say there isn't anything in the beginning, but then you're going to have to explain how you know anything is real, if that's the case, right? If you're going to be a pure human, you're going to accept that things exist on a practical level, but you don't actually know it. And that's really Hume's point. Hume's point is, sure, day to day, we get in our, well, he wouldn't get in a car, but you, you strap on your boots and you, you walk to the market and you buy your parsnips and you walk home, right? And you can kind of assume all those things are going to happen, but you don't know that they're going to happen. You don't have a justified true belief that those things are going to happen, right? So uh, he or she finishes with, if the idea is that the single God presupposition explains the rest, I see no good reason to accept this, especially as it is possible to postulate a cause that isn't a God that can explain the other presuppositions just as well. Yes, exactly. <laughs> right. So, so you understand. You can postulate anything as a starting point, but then everything else in your worldview has to logically follow from that. Otherwise, you have inherent contradictions and you're not going to make any sense. Now, it might not matter to you, right? Normal person walking around, whatever. But if you're going to get into a philosophical discussion or involve yourself in a theistic dialogue on YouTube, you might want to have some concept of this and perhaps ask questions instead of just jumping in and saying you find this weird. But inherently, you don't because you actually do this too, whether you know it or not. It's just that most people contradict themselves on a minute to minute basis when they try to explain how they know something, which is fine because most people don't do philosophy. Now, I, I don't think that's a good thing. I think people should stop watching TV and start reading books um, and pay more attention to developing their brain activity. But, you know, some people don't want to do that. So that's fine. But for the folks here, we want to make sure we're, we're being clear and fair to the position. Yes, you could postulate a cause that isn't God that can explain other presuppositions just as well. But then you have to, if you're going to engage in this dialogue, right, this thousands of year conversation of philosophy, you're going to have to explain how you know for sure what you're dealing with is actually reality. And that's all we're saying. We're saying that the Orthodox Christian God, Yahweh, right, the Trinity, <laughs> 
right? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that that is our starting point from which everything else follows. And ultimately, that that comports onto reality, kind of like a life hack onto reality in a way that no other worldview can, could, does at all. That's what we're saying. That's the argument, of course, right? And, and now I think we backed that up in numerous videos, but <clears throat> I don't expect everyone to agree with that. I just expect if they're going to disagree, they have to come back with another argument, right? Not they're annoyed at this or they're bothered by that. They have to present an argument. That's how philosophy works. It's okay if you don't want to present an argument. That's fine. Just ask a question or make a comment or whatever. That's fine. But the argument requires you to have some understanding of the confidence in expressing your worldview without contradicting yourself, right? So uh, that's out of the way. <clears throat> and I will um, I will put in the show notes that we'll do this. the reading here. We're what, 16 minutes in? Man, did I talk about that person for 16 minutes? Holy crap. Uh, all right. So <laughs> about 16, 17 minutes in, we're going to start doing the D.K. thing here. So um, let me go ahead and just pull this up. So I have three books here. Um, I'm going to be reading off something on the screen so that you guys can follow along. But this is the Rick Brannon Apostolic Fathers uh, translation. And it's got, you know, a bunch of stuff in here. D.K., Martyrdom, Polycarp, Shepherd of Hermas, right? Ignatius Letters, uh, Clement, right? Um, it's a good translation for the most part. I mean, what I try, what I would love to do is really, if I could learn ancient Greek uh, or Kine Greek, and kind of put all of these translations together, sort of find out which ones work better. Because they're all different. Every translation is different. And a lot of the time they do it because they want a copyright on the story. Right. So there might be one or two words that are interpreted differently. And they're going to convince you this is real, more real than the other translation. But really what they just want is Lexham Press here wants their own version that they can copyright. Right. So that's one that we have. The other one that I really like here is the Sparks, the uh, Jack Sparks translations, All right? This book's a little worn, it's kind of falling apart a little bit, but uh, um, it's got a really good couple of introductions to, uh, the Brennan book doesn't have any, and really any introductions, but this book has good introductions and it's got more, um, there's more content in it as well, All right? So that's the, the second one, and then the one I really like the most is the Michael Holmes Apostolic Fathers Greek text and English translations. It's not interlinear, but if you look here, um, we just jumped to one of the pages. You can see the Greek on one side and the English on the other side. Uh, and not that I can read Kine Greek, but um, I know people who can. So if I have a question, I can at least take a screenshot of this and I can send it to somebody, you know, one or two people I know that will hopefully respond to me and work me through it. So this is the one that I use. And there's um, like Diognetus is also in here and there's fragments of uh, Papias in here too that aren't in the other books. So um, anyway, those are the three that I have. And I think there's a, maybe a fourth one on the shelf, but it, I couldn't find it. And that means it wasn't worth bringing down. But what we're going to use today is off of the Legacy Icons uh, website. And it's public here, so I'm not, Worried about breaking any copyright rules. We don't want any Protestants coming after me and suing me. So let's go ahead and just do share screen. D.K. Share. All right. So I'm assuming you guys can see that. All right. So before we do, I'm going to read the intro out of... Um, out of the Holmes book, because I think that's probably the most helpful here. All right. So the teaching of the Lord to the Gentiles by the 12 apostles or the teaching of the 12 apostles, as it was known in ancient times, or simply the Didache, D-I-D-A-C-H-E, which is a transliteration. Didache means the teaching in Greek, the teaching. As it is usually known today, is one of the most fascinating yet perplexing documents to emerge from the early church. Although the title was known from references to it by ancient writers, some of whom apparently use it as scripture, 
And he cites Clement of Alexandria origin and Didymus the Blind here as examples. No copy was known to, exi to exist until 1873 when Philoteos Birenios discovered a manuscript that contained, among other things, the full text of the Didache, which he published in 1883. Since then, it has been the focus of scholarly attention to an extent quite out of proportion to its modest length. Yet for all that attention, such basic information as who wrote it and where and when it was written remains as much a mystery as when it was first discovered. Three sections are evident in this anonymous document. One which offers, sorry, 1.1 to 6.2, which offers teaching about the, quote, two ways of life and death. 6.3 to 15.4, compromise of instructions dealing with church practice and order. And 16.1 to 8, a brief apocalyptic section. The two ways material appears to have been intended in light of 7.1 as a summary of basic instruction about the Christian life to be taught to those who were preparing for baptism and church membership. The, quote, way of life, which opens with the love command and the golden rule is comprised almost entirely of do's and don'ts, while the way of death is a description of evil actions and persons. The second part of the document consists of instructions about food, baptism, fasting, prayer, and the Eucharist, and assorted practical issues related to various ministries and positions of leadership, in addition to providing the earliest evidence of a mode of baptism other than immersion, it records the oldest known Christian Eucharistic prayers and a form of the Lord's Prayer quite familiar, quite similar to that found in the Gospel of Matthew. There is a concern to differentiate Christian practice from Jewish piety and to prevent abuses of the church's hospitality. The document closes with an apocalyptic section, perhaps incomplete, that has much in common with the so-called synoptic apocalypse found in Mark 13, Matthew 24, and Luke 24. In its, pre in its present form, the two-way section represents the Christianization by means of, e.g., the insertion of collections of gospel sayings and related admonitions of a common Jewish form of moral instruction. Material similar to that of the two-way section is found in a number of other church writings from the first through the fifth centuries, including the Epistle of Barnabas, the Apostolic Church Order, the Summary of Doctrine, the Apostolic Constitutions, the Life of Shenute. Shenute, if I remember correctly, that's uh, Oriental Orthodox, I believe, Coptic, uh, maybe. Shenute, wasn't Shenute a Coptic monk, if I remember correctly? And, uh, and on the teaching of the apostles, some of which are dependent on the Didache itself. The interrelationships between these various documents are quite complex and much remains to be worked out. The connections between the Didache and the Epistle of Barnabas have been the focus of considerable attention. Rather than either one being directly dependent upon the other, it seems much more likely that both are dependent, perhaps indirectly, on a common source and thus are examples of what Kraft has termed evolved literature in which similar material may be utilized quite differently. <clears throat> the, quote, church order section also bears evidence of change over time, but the evolved, quote, nature of this part of the document is due at least in part to its origin in a Christian community that is itself evolving. The transition from itinerant ministers to resident leadership is evident, as is tension between the ideal and the actual. The explanation of composite character of the Didache is much debated. Some consider it to be the work of a single individual who combined traditional material, both written and oral, with original contributions to create the document as we read it today, while others view it as a community production. Many consider it to have evolved in stages, its current form uh, being the result of the work of multiple contributors at various times. One common consequence of the view that, that the Didache is a composite document is the conclusion or perhaps assumption that it is a collage lacking any consistent internal structure or coherence. Not all, however, are convinced this is the case. Indeed, Malevich has argued, Malevich has argued at length that the document has a previously overlooked general internal coherence arising from its own internal logic and rooted in its character as a fundamentally oral document. Clearly, the last word has yet to be said on this matter. Um, and I'll just I'll, uh, iterate here. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to bring this up is maybe to start this dialogue because um, I was just driving home from work today and thought, man, I, I want to get out a show. <laughs> this is an easy, quick read. Um, easy might not be the right word. It's a quick, it's a quick read. Um, and we'll be able to pump it out. And then I thought to myself, man, you know, I, I don't really have time to go and look at a bunch of Orthodox sources here. Um, it would be really cool if you y'all did that and then responded to this with, you know, what, what do some of the um, Orthodox church, what do some saints say about this? What do some church fathers say about this? Um, I mean, I recall flipping through certain books up on the shelf, and I know they've mentioned the Didache, but 
I wish I had some kind of database to cross-reference all of this, <laughs> this stuff on that shelf because my brain can't remember all these things. So it would be cool if somebody out there were to respond to, you know, here's what so-and-so says about it. Here's what so-and-so says about it. And maybe we could jump off uh, and have a conversation based on that once we're done kind of reading the text. So, um, and of course, this wasn't, this translation wasn't published like yesterday too. So it's possible. When was this put out? 2007 was this, this edition. So we're almost 20 years, right? Since this one came out. Um, so it'd be cool to see, you know, other people say, <clears throat> but, um, anyway, a remarkable, remarkably wide range of dates extending from before AD 50 to the third century or later has been proposed for this document. Dating the D.K. is made difficult by a lack of hard evidence and by its composite character. Thus, the date when the anonymous author or authors compiled this document on the basis of earlier materials must be differentiated from the time represented by the materials so utilized. The D.K. may have been put into its present form as late as 150, though a date considerably closer to the end of the first century seems more probable. And I, I've heard somewhere between 80 and 120, I think. Uh, Lord of Spirits talked about this, um, I think, rather recently. <clears throat> the materials from which it was composed reflect the state of the church at an even earlier time. The relative simplicity of the prayers, the continuing concern to differentiate Christian practice from Jewish rituals, and in particular, the form of church structure, note the twofold structure of bishops and deacons, and the continued existence, excuse me, of traveling apostles and prophets alongside a resident ministry reflect a time closer to that of Paul and James, who died in the 60s, than Ignatius, who died sometime after 110. Egypt and Syria are mentioned most often as possible places of origin of the DDK. The evidence is indirect and circumstantial and complicated again by the document's composite nature. The reference to, quote, mountains in 9.4 would appear to suggest a Syrian or Syro-Palestinian provenance for at least some of the material. Final editing, however, may have occurred elsewhere, indeed, almost anywhere. Well, not anywhere, right? It didn't occur in Australia, but it's probably, I mean, Egypt and Syria were, were you know, and Turkey really were, you know, real hotbeds for Christian, um, for Christians in the early, you know, first couple of centuries. So, yeah, I, I, that seems reasonable to me. Uh, the question of the relationship of the DDK to the early Christian documents that were later incorporated into the New Testament is a difficult one. Traditionally, scholars have viewed the D.K. as dependent on one or two documents now found in the New Testament, Matthew in particular, and perhaps Luke. This conclusion, however, was for the most part built on the assumption that the D.K. was composed some years or decades after the writing of Matthew and Luke. Once this assumption was exposed, the ambiguity, ambiguity of the data became evident. The term gospel occurs three times, but we cannot determine whether it refers to a single document or to the gospel story in general. Similarly, the parallels between Matthew and the D.K. may be variously explained direct or perhaps only indirect dependence on the DDK on Matthew, dependence of both documents on shared tradition, dependence of Matthew on the DDK or complete inter <laughs> independence of the DDK from any known gospel source. Uh, so they're either, they have something to do with each other or they don't. <laughs> it's this, this, this guy's conclusion. So, um, and then there's some, um, there's just some stuff here on like the texts, how the text is written, how it's interpreted, and then a very extensive bibliography which is cool in a, in a book like this. It's a, like a three page bibliography. Um, and I don't, nothing's jumping out at me here as specifically Orthodox. Definitely some Draper is in here. Yeah. When, um, there's definitely Protestant like JSOT stuff going on here. So, Anyway, you guys can check this out. It's the Apostolic Fathers Greek Texts and English Translations, third edition by Michael W. Holmes. But what we're going to be reading here that uh, you see on the screen, this is from, from, from legacyicons.com slash content slash d.k dot pdf. Uh, okay. <clears throat> the d.k won the two ways. There are two ways, one of life and one of death, and there is a great difference between the two ways. The way of life is this. First of all, you shall love the God who made you. Second, love your neighbor as yourself. And all things you would not want done to you, do not do to another person. Now the teaching of these words is this. Bless those who curse you, pray for your enemies, and fast for those who persecute you. For what credit is it to you if you love those who love you? Do the people of the nations not do the same? But you should love those who hate you, and you will not have an enemy. 
abstain from the desires of the flesh and of the body. If anyone strikes you on your right cheek, turn the other cheek to him also, and you will be perfect. <clears throat> if anyone compels you to go out one mile, go with him for two miles. If anyone takes away your coat, give him your shirt also. If anyone takes away what is yours, do not demand its return, for you cannot. To anyone who asks something of you, give it to him. Do not ask for it back, for the Father desires that gifts be given to all from his own riches. From his, by the way, capital his own riches. Blessed is he who gives charitably according to the commandment, for he is blameless. Woe to him who receives. If a needy man receives charity, he is blameless. But anyone is not in need will be called to account for why he accepted it. And being imprisoned, he will be interrogated concerning his actions, and he will not be released until he has repaid every last penny. Indeed, it has also been said, let your alms sweat in your hands until you have discerned to whom you will give. The second commandment. This is the second commandment of the teaching. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not be sexually perverse. You shall not be sexually promiscuous. You shall not steal. You shall not practice magic. You shall not practice sorcery. You shall not murder a child by abortion, nor kill a child at birth. You shall not covet your neighbor's things. You shall not commit perjury. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not speak evil. You shall not bear a grudge. You shall not be double-minded nor double-tongued, for the double tongue is a snare of death. Your world shall not be false nor empty, but fulfilled in your actions. You shall not be greedy, nor a swindler, nor a hypocrite, nor bad-tempered, nor proud. You shall not plot against your neighbor. You shall not hate any man, but you shall reprove some, and you shall pray for others, and you shall love more than your own life. <clears throat> the Fences My child, flee from every evil thing and everything that is like it. Do not be angry, for anger leads to murder. Do not be jealous, nor argumentative, nor hot-tempered, for all of these things give birth to murder. My child, do not be lustful, for lust leads to sexual promiscuity. Do not speak obscenely and do not have wandering eyes, for all of these things give birth to promiscuity. My child, do not deal in omens, since it leads to idolatry. Do not be an enchanter, nor an astrologer, nor a magician. Do not even be around such things, for all of these things give birth to idolatry. My child, do not be a liar, since it leads to theft. Do not be greedy or vain, for all of these things give birth to theft. My child, be not a complainer, since it leads to blasphemy. Do not be stubborn nor evil-minded, for all of these things give birth to blasphemy. Be meek, since the meek shall inherit the earth. Be patient and merciful and sincere and quiet and kind, and always fearing the words which you have heard. Do not praise yourself and do not let arrogance enter your soul. Do not join your soul with a pompous person, but walk only with the righteous and the humble. Whatever happens to you, accept it as good, knowing that nothing is done without God. My child, remember him who proclaims to you the word of God. Remember him night and day and honor him as the Lord. For wherever he speaks, the Lord himself is there. Every day, seek out the company of the saints, that you may find rest in their words. Do not cause division, but bring peace between those who dispute. Judge righteously. Do not favor one side when you reprove others. Do not be double-minded when you consider whether or not a thing should be. Do not hold out your hand to receive, only to pull your hand back when you should give. If you have gained something through your work, give it away as a ransom for your sins. Do not hesitate to give nor complain when you give, for you know the good paymaster of your reward. Do not turn away from anyone who is in need, but share everything with your brother. And do not say that anything is your own. For if you all share in the heavenly things, how much more in earthly things? Do not relax your control over your son or your daughter, but from their youth teach them the fear of God. Do not give a command in your anger to your servant, who trusts in the same God, lest he ceases to fear the God who is over both of you. For he does not call men according to worldly status, but he comes to those whom the Spirit has prepared. And you who are servants, be obedient to your masters as to God, in respect and fear. Hate all hypocrisy and everything that is not pleasing to the Lord. Never forsake the Lord's commandments but you shall guard the things which you have received, neither adding to them nor taking away from them. Confess your sins in church and do not go to prayer with a guilty conscience. This is the way of life. The way of death. But the way of death is this. First of all, it is evil and full of curses, murder, adultery, lust, promiscuity, theft, idolatry, magical arts, witchcraft, robbery, false testimony, hypocrisy, duplicity, treachery, pride, malice, stubbornness, greed, foul language, jealousy, arrogance, pride, and boasting. 
persecutors of good men, hating truth, loving a lie, not knowing the reward of righteousness, not adhering to the good nor to good judgment, alert to evil rather than to good, neither gentle nor patient, loving worthless things, pursuing a reward, not having mercy on the poor, not working for the downtrodden, not recognizing the God who made them, murderers of children, corruptors of God's creation, turning away from the needy, oppressing the afflicted, advocates of the rich, unjust judges of the poor, sinful in every way. May you be delivered, my children, from all these things. Conclusion. Beware from this way of righteousness, for he teaches apart from God. For if you can bear the whole yoke of the Lord, you will be perfect. But if you cannot, do as much as you can. Instructions for Catechumens, Part 2. Now concerning eating, observe the traditions as best you can, but do not eat meat sacrificed to idols, for it is the worship of dead gods. Concerning baptism, baptize in this way. Having instructed him in all of these teachings, baptize the catechumen in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit in running water. But if you do not have running water, then baptize in other water. And if you cannot in cold water, use warm. But if you have neither, then pour water on the head three times in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And before the baptism, let both the baptizer and the catechumen fast, and also any others who are able. And be sure that the catechumen fasts a day or two before. Concerning fasting, do not let your fast fall on the same days as the hypocrites, for they fast on Mondays and Thursdays. Keep your fast on Wednesdays and Fridays. Do not pray as the hypocrites either, but pray as the Lord commanded in his gospel. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the power and the glory unto ages of ages. Pray this way three times a day. Now concerning the Eucharistic Thanksgiving, give thanks in this way. First, as concerning the cup, we give you thanks, our Father, for the holy vine of your son David, which you made known to us through your son Jesus. Yours is the glory unto ages of ages. Then, as regards the broken bread, we give you thanks, our Father, for the life and knowledge which you have no made known to us through your son Jesus. Yours is the glory unto ages of ages. And this broken bread was scattered upon the mountains and being gathered together became one. So may your church be gathered together from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. For yours is the glory and the power through Jesus Christ, unto ages of ages. Do not let anyone eat or drink of this Eucharist who has not been baptized into the name of the Lord. For concerning this, the Lord has said, Do not give the holy things to the dogs. And after you have been filled, give thanks as follows. We give you thanks, Holy Father, for your holy name, which you have made to dwell in our hearts, and for the knowledge and faith and immortality, which you have made known to us through your Son, Jesus. Yours is the glory unto ages of ages. You, Almighty Master, created for all things, for your name's sake, and gave food and drink to men for their enjoyment, that they may give you thanks. And you have given us spiritual food and drink and eternal life through your Son. Most of all, we give you thanks that you are powerful. Yours is the glory unto ages of ages. Remember, Lord, your church, and deliver it from all evil, and to perfect it in thy love. Gather it, the sanctified one, together from the four winds into your kingdom, which you have prepared for it. For yours is the power and the glory unto ages of ages. May grace come, and may this world pass away. Hosanna to the God of David. If any man is holy, let him come. If any man is not, let him repent. Marathana. Amen. But permit the prophets to offer thanksgiving as much as they desire. Now concerning the ointment, give thanks as follows. We give you thanks, our Father, for the fragrant ointment which you have made known to us through your Son, Jesus. Yours is the glory unto ages of ages. Amen. The Approved Teacher. Whoever comes and teaches you all these things that have been taught before, receive him. But if the teacher himself turns aside and teaches a different doctrine and subverts what has been taught before, do not listen to him. If his teaching fosters righteousness and the knowledge of the Lord, receive him as the Lord. Three, life in the community. Apostles and prophets. Concerning apostles and prophets, act according to the gospel's teaching. Receive every apostle as the Lord. He should not stay for more than a single day or two days if necessary. But if he remains for three days, he is a false prophet. When he leaves, let the apostle receive nothing except bread until he finds a place to stay. But if he asks for money, he is a false prophet. Do not test or judge any prophet who speaks in the spirit. Every other sin will be forgiven, but this sin will not be forgiven. 
And not everyone who speaks in the spirit is a prophet, but only he who follows the way of ways of the Lord. From his behavior, then, you will know a false prophet from a true prophet. Any prophet who orders a meal in spirit will not eat from it, but if he does eat of it, he is a false prophet. Any prophet who teaches the truth but does not do the things he teaches is a false prophet. Every true prophet, if he performs a worldly mystery of the church, but does not teach others to do likewise, he must not be judged by you. He has had, he has his judgment in the presence of God, as with the prophets of old. If anyone says in the spirit, give me money, do not listen to him. But if he tells you to give to others who are in need, let no one judge him. Hospitality to travelers. Receive everyone who comes in the name of the Lord. Examine him and learn the nature of his situation. If he is only passing through, help him as much as you can, but he must not stay with you more than two or three days. If he wishes to settle with you and knows a trade, let him work and earn his bread. If he does not know a trade, use your judgment to decide how he should live as a Christian among you, but not in idleness. If he will not do this, he is trafficking upon Christ. Beware of such men. Supporting God's ministers. Every true prophet who desires to settle among you is worthy of his food. Likewise, a true teacher, like the worker, deserves his food. Take every first fruit of the wine press and of the threshing floor of your oxen and of your sheep and give as the first fruit to the prophets, for they are your high priests. But if you do not have a prophet, give your first fruits to the poor. If you make bread, take the first fruit and give according to the commandment. Likewise, when you open a jug of wine or oil, take the first fruit and give to the prophets. And so with money and clothing and every possession, take the first fruit as it seems appropriate to you and give according to the commandment. The Sacrifice Gather together each Sunday, break bread and give thanks, first confessing your sins that your sacrifice may be pure. And let no man, having a disagreement with his brother, join you until they have been reconciled, that your sacrifice your sacrifice may not be defiled. For it was this sacrifice that was spoken by the Lord. In every place and at every time, offer me a pure sacrifice, for I am a great king, says the Lord, and my name is wonderful among the nations. Church leaders. Appoint for yourselves, bishops and deacons who are worthy of the Lord, men who are meek and not lovers of money, and who are honest and proven, for they also perform the service of the prophets and teachers. Therefore, do not hold them in contempt, for they are honorable men, along with the prophets and teachers. Community discipline. Reprove one another, not in anger, but in peace, as you find in the gospel. Shun anyone who has sinned against his neighbor. Do not say a word to him until he repents. But say your prayers and give your alms and do everything according to the gospel of our Lord. 4. The Lord is coming. Watch over your life. Do not let your lamps burn out, nor your waist be ungirdled. But be ready, for you do not know when our Lord is coming. And gather together frequently, seeking what is necessary for your souls. For all your years of faith will count for nothing unless you are perfected in the last days. In the last days, false prophets and corruptors will multiply and the sheep will turn into wolves and love will be turned into hate. As lawlessness increases, men will hate and persecute and betray one another. And then the deceiver of the world will appear as a son of God and will do signs and wonders and the earth will be delivered into his hands. He will commit abominations which have never been seen since the world began. Then all mankind will come to the fire of testing and many will fail and perish. But those who endure in their faith will be saved by him. Who was accursed. And then shall the signs of the truth appear, first a sign of a rift in the heavens, and then a sign of a voice of a trumpet, and thirdly, the resurrection of the dead. And yet, and not yet not of all, but as it was said, the Lord shall come and all his saints with him. Then the world will see the Lord coming upon the clouds of heaven with power and dominion to repay each man according to his works with justice before all men and the angels. Amen. Early hymns and prayers. <clears throat> so this, as far as I know, is the end here. Um, and then there's like prayers that, that they work through. Um, I don't believe this is, I want to just look it up real quick. I don't think this is the same in the translations. Just real quick. Maybe, maybe there is. Maybe it's the same. No, these are added by these people. Okay, so to supplement the ancient preaching, 
Christian teachings in the DDK, we have included below a selection of early Christian hymns and prayers dating to the first few generations of the church. Timeless in their beauty, many of these are still used and still inspire Christians today. So uh, I'm not going to read these off. I, I, I very rarely do hymns and beautiful things like this justice. I'm sure I didn't even do the DDK justice, but I wanted to get it out there. And this, these are really cool. Like you have a doxology here. This is obviously orthodox, right? So I'll link this. Let me just copy it right now. I'll put it in the show notes. And it looks like we, we're going to we're gonna be able to get this under an hour pretty easily. Um, appreciate you guys tuning in for this. We'll go ahead and we'll, we'll probably do more from the Apostolic Fathers. I mean, that, that's by far the shortest of them. Um, I read through First Clement and I was able to do it under two hours just reading it in my head. Uh, so I think that could be one we could do. And then there's a couple like Shepherd of Hermits is super long. Maybe we could do a couple parts of that. Um, and then of course I have this ambition to tackle the moral landscape by Sam Harris. <laughs> but the problem with that is it's it, the, the super like horseman of atheism thing is super depressing and just really hard to get motivated to deal with. Right. It's like 20 pages into the book. You're like, dude, Ugh. so <laughs> Uh, bear with me. We'll get there. I, I realize that there's plenty of people taking down Sam Harris at far corners of the internet. So it's, I'm sure it's not a huge rush for you guys. It's just a monkey. I'd like to get off my back. Um, definitely leave comments. If, um, auntie theist juror would like to respond. Uh, I hope you find that I wasn't belittling. So I don't, I don't wear on you too much, but, uh, I, th I think we need to be clear. Um, it's not necessarily anyone's fault if they're just listening to you know, bits and pieces here and there. And of course, once someone has decided they don't like an idea, it's going to be difficult to get them to like the idea after that, right? But we want to set up the 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 premise here that worldviews are unavoidable, right? And that ultimately the the what is assumed as your starting point is also unavoidable. We'll say God, they say something else, right? But what we want to try to move people to is some concept of the spiritual or immaterial and admit to that. And then we can start to have the same conversation. And then we can actually progress towards something positive that bears fruit rather than talk past each other and ultimately get upset. And what actually makes us very helpful, I think, ultimately in the end, is it also calls to light poor Christian apologetics, right? There's plenty of that. And it's, and those are easy. Uh, it's easy for an atheist or a non-believer to attack those much easier than it is for someone to attack what I'm saying. It's just easier. I'm not saying they can't do it or they're not intelligent enough to have the conversation, but it's easy to go find like a, you know, biblical creationist, uh, guy who runs a house church in Texas. It's easier to go after that dude, right? Who's got zero training in philosophy or theology, just picked up a Bible and had six people come to his house and he talks about the world 6,000 years old, right? It's easy to hit that dude up. <laughs> so we want to also make sure that we're not falling into that trap and we want to help, um, you know, point people toward the Orthodox church, point people toward clergy, point people toward scholars here so that they can understand for, for Roman Catholics and Protestants, this is your tradition too. And really, if we believe the Orthodox faith, it's everyone's tradition that, that, that exists on the planet has ever existed or ever will. Um, and that's what we want people to understand. So, uh, I, I, I'm sure I'm not the nicest person in the world when I bring this stuff up all the time, but ultimately I think that's what we're, we're trying to accomplish. All right, everybody. So that's going to be it for me today. Um, I appreciate you tuning in. I hope everybody has a wonderful weekend. You are welcome for the short video. Uh, please go ahead and reward everyone who's listening to this with comments and make sure you like and subscribe and share it with your friends or your enemies or literally everybody. All right. All right, everybody. Be well. We will talk to you soon.